Welcome to a video and review of Bill Clinton's presidency. Now, how am I an expert on this? Well, I've read several books about Mr. Clinton, but not only that, but I know very nuanced things, and I think that we need to take this year by year to an extent, and that is to say that Bill Clinton as a man, <clears throat> you know, if you hear audiobooks, autobiography even, you know, things like that, you would understand that he comes from white trash. He is ostensibly a guy who clearly, clearly is disenfranchised to begin with. And, you know, funnily enough, his name isn't even Clinton. It's Blythe. It should be William Jefferson Blythe the third. but his father dies in a car crash, I believe, in the 40s when he is in his mother's stomach. Now, this is really interesting because he is a bastard child, but not traditionally, you know, it was an accident. A widowed wife was his mother, and he went not only to that, but to be president, and he really started off in a democratic south, you know, growing up. He grew up in a segregated area and so forth, and you claim that he very clearly does not, you know, relate to the struggles of maybe richer people because he started off so low. He's even worse off than Obama in a lot of ways, honestly. And this is part of the reason why people call him the first black president. <clears throat> so, now onwards to his college. Now, Bill was always a talented person in so far as he was able to be charismatic, and he was always looking to be president ever since he was 16. Why? Well, he personally wanted to become the guy who was first, you know, he, he really shook hands with the president, and he felt inspired. Now, that was when he was 16, and he was, I think, a Boy Scout at that point. But now in college, he was going to places like Georgetown University, as well as Oxford. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He shares this with maybe Pete Buttigieg and other Rhodes Scholars that are very important to know about. He is part of the Kappa Kappa uh, PSI or, or Psi or whatever that is. So he was a fraternity guy. He even was an intern for the clerk of Arkansas Senator, uh, Senator William Fulbright. And that is to say that he was even class president in, in the 60s. He was always political, okay? That road uh, scholarship was exactly that motivation that he wanted to go to a foreign place. He wanted to exploit his opportunity. And he was an opportunistic guy. And that's the way you become big in politics anyway. Bill Clinton always wanted to be in politics so much so that while he should have been drafted, he avoided it by getting the college exemption or, you know, a lot of other people like Trump uh, used bone spurs and other excuses not to join while his vice president albert gore served in the war i'm pretty sure and uh, i think john Kerry served as well it would not make sense that he obviously didn't uh join it did make sense that in the political spectrum he didn't because he was busy in britain and doing other things now he was attorney general of arkansas from 77 to 79 this was in his early 30s, so he was already involved in politics from an early age. But not only that, but he was able to come back and, um, look, Arkansas Attorney General isn't a big thing. Most people don't become that on purpose. Look, they do that on purpose only if it's a political climbing ladder. It is known to be easy to become an Attorney General of a small state and then climb up to be governor in that next election, that next opportunistic moment. And I think Bill Clinton was exactly what you needed there. So then after he does this, he goes on to become the governor of Arkansas. The governor of Arkansas is an important role as this is the highest office he'll get until he becomes president. He doesn't become a congressman. Noted he is not a senator at all. He is not a even House of Representatives, uh, you know, he's not even a lawmaker within the local and state uh, spectrum in politics. So he becomes a lawyer. That lawyer is, to, you know, him becoming a lawyer and looking into political science was his ultimate goal so that he could become attorney general very easily, which is not so much how good of a lawyer you are, but how much of a popularity contest you can run. And Bill Clinton is very good at doing those things. Now, Bill was able to become, after the Watergate scandal, 
the attorney general, and then governor from 79 to 81, and then he loses in 81 because he raised taxes. He raises taxes because he wanted to pay for things. Now, he's known as a tax and spend Democrat. That really hurt him in a conservative area like Arkansas, and this in particular was poignant as he was a young guy, and even raising driver's license taxes and fees could get you booted out of the office of the governor, you know, the governor's mansion. So so that was a bad thing for him. Now, he was only 32 years old when he grabbed office. This ob obviously made him more popular as he was the youngest governor in the country. And due to his youthful appearance, you know, he had the black hair at this point. He was n known as the boy governor. Now, he was in particular interesting because he defeated multiple Republicans, including the one, I, former governor, me, Frank huh? Derwood White. Hi. Hi. What's your name? And he pulled ahead of him. Governor Clinton, do I need to get one of these? Right. Oh, okay. He even removed the Hello. sales tax from medications How are and you? increased good. proper Hello. tax exemptions. Good to so see you. Can you shake hands? That's good. The, even the Thank local you. Government, governor, this uh, looks good. I like government. it. Uh, smaller and he would push One for I'll be disappointed. I'll try reform. not to cheat. And he was not a franchise by the way. Sure, what's your name? Your name? You were in there, weren't you? You didn't get to ask your question? To what's this? Particular control the me the medium spectrum, and that's the new Democrat okay. position. Shoot. He fundamentally How are you? Do you have any skill? Yeah. Thank you. What's really your name? Fact, think, that he could Thank say you. I'm Bill Clinton. I'm glad to see you. That he wanted to Hello. Do for America. How you doing? <laughs> What's your name? It's nice to meet Arkansas you, Teresa. Like How long do you work here? Here? Years years in education for 40 years. So it's nice to see you. Nice to meet you. you. Thanks. And in terms of the whole country, right? But he did not do anything too decisive in the state. But since he was able to do all these programs in name, like a child education program or a new child care program, it was able to net him brownie points in the left. Okay. And the 1988 Democratic primaries, he was warned that he could have entered after Governor Mario Cuomo decided not to run. And Mario Cuomo was an important figure in Democratic politics as he was a multi-term governor of New York. And those delegates that would have been his ostensibly would have made him a, a favorite candidate at the time. Okay, so Democratic frontrunner Gary Hart uh, pulled out because he had marital infidelities, which is interesting because Bill Clinton saw this and said that he did not want to join because in his head, if he already knew that he was a cheater and a pervert, that it would come out and, and kill his campaign. This somewhat happened in 1992 until he came back. Now, he was able to become governor up until the 90s, of course, serving four terms, I believe. He endorsed Governor Michael Dukakis, which is important because Dukakis was a Northeastern liberal, having the Southern Conservative Democrat, New Democrat, uh, Bill Clinton, up-and-coming star of the Democratic Party as a whole on the national front. Having his endorsement is good for the uh, uh, prosperity, uh, posterity of the Democratic Party, as we see it today. He was able to make a speech in the 1988 Democratic Na National Convention, <clears throat> which was double the length of what it should have been, and it was poorly delivered, and Clinton said that this was his biggest political mistake up until that point. Very interestingly, interesting, interestingly enough, Bill was very important insofar as he was able to exploit the moment in 1992, you know, being ostensibly term limited, limited and also not being... Uh, not going for a Senate seat at the time because there was a gap there. Hillary Rodham Clinton was unpopular, so she could not become governor. And him live through through her like that, like he she had done with him. He was able to go through and become president by exploiting the weakness of George H. W. Bush. Now, H. W. had the problem of a recession, which is already a year away. But economic growth, which should have been under Reagan, you know, under the Reaganomics, about three to four to even five or six or seven percent, like it was in 1984, it was at 0.1% or it was at 1%. So it was very weak, especially for the time. Not like Obama's economy where one or two percent growth is the normal. But in this case, it's terrible growth. <clears throat> so 
this was very important. Now, the fiscal conservatives, the su supply side conservatives in the Republican Party in the primary in 1992 were attacking George H.W. Bush, Pat Buchanan, most especially the paleoconservative from the farther right section of the Republican Party at the time, primaried H.W. and made strong performances in places like New Hampshire because he, he was gutting the he was gutting the industrial sector and he was letting jobs go to China, for example, or Mexico. And he was letting in immigration, which was hurting the country, and he did not balance the budget. He had multi-hundred billion dollar uh, deficits and he bailed out the savings and loan industry under Ronald Reagan and he fundamentally did not solve that, of course, because there was a recession in 1990. So this whole, this goes with the uh, pronunciation of the you know, the undertone of the decade, which was the deficit, which is very important. And that's why Bill Clinton managed to balance the budget by the end of the century, because it was so important. In 1992, it was a top three issue at the time. Foreign diplomacy was a very good point under George W. Bush, but the domestic side was weak. He did not have a plan for health care necessarily, and he was not for changing much. Whereas... Bill Clinton was reform-minded, and he was especially trying to change things and gear things more towards the middle class. Now, he had the perception of being for the middle class, but he was not actually for them insofar as he was not opposed to immigration nor the offsourcing of jobs because he was pro-NAFTA. Now, NAFTA was a thing under George H.W. Bush, but he ran on that message. Bill Clinton, at the cost of labor support, obviously did support NAFTA, but at the same time, Bill Clinton was to was to non sequitur his way through these tough questions of being anti liberal uh, yeah, being opposed to the liberal orthodoxy by saying that he felt the person's pain that was asking him these hard questions, that he knew how he was affected personally by the debt and how he was interpersonally a lot more adept than the genius that was George H. W. Bush at the time. And it is very important to understand this, which is why, though only winning a plurality, Bill Clinton destroyed H.W. Bush. Now, there's the concern about Ross Perot, but I've seen 80% of Ross Perot's voters were new voters, so those wouldn't have, most of them wouldn't have turned out. So, anyway, if you were to take out Ross Perot, it is politically and scientifically proven that. George H.W. Bush would have gotten five more electoral votes, which was not even close to making up the difference. So Bill won on his own merit, with or without Ross. And even Ross Perot dropped out in summer of 1992 for the Democratic Convention because he thought that Bill Clinton had implemented the deficit reduction plan deeply into his campaign so that he could finally rest and put the mantle on him to balance the budget. Now, Ross Perot came back in the race last minute, but it was not enough, and clearly... He had some vague trust on Bill Clinton and the Democratic Party. When he was inaugurated as the president in 1993, he signed the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, which required employers to give un to to take unpaid leave for pregnancy, for example, as said uh, bipartisan support. So it wasn't even paid leave, but it was unpaid at least. So what you see is that throughout these two terms, he was able to. <clears throat> pay off people or, you know, make these compromise deals that move the needle more liberal but ultimately was centrist. This is the new Democrat message. It is chipping away at things, whether it be expanding civil rights or cutting away at other rights of, you know, like the Second Amendment, for example. He made his first address to the nation a month into his presidency to raise taxes to close the budget deficit. And two days la later, that really tanked the stock market. And he was able to, with the benefit of the chair, Alan Greenspan, to artificially lower the interest rates to promote growth. And with an average growth rate of 4%, he was able to get lucky with the technology boom and be able to balance the budget eventually. Now, he was able also to increase taxes by 1.2% or raise taxes, sorry, on one po on the top 1.2% of taxpayers. So if you made lower than $140,000, your taxes did not go up necessarily 
for in terms of income tax but if you did made more you paid more also he wanted to put a five percent or a five cent tax gasoline tax on the uh, on gasoline so this was a regressive tax he got hit from the left because it hurt it de-incentivized the middle class to work and it also made the gasoline tax a total about 16 cents as it is now not only that but all these regressive ways of doing it he also thought of a payroll tax increase which to balance the budget which was regressive as well so he compromised with the left and he was able under george mitchell the democratic uh, leader of the of the senate to pass some tax hikes that was able to somewhat close that gap but he was also able to make all these insignificant cuts that totaled about 20 billion dollars at the end of five years to or 10 years sorry to cut the deficit ever so slightly and remember he made the promise of cutting 500 billion out of the deficit by the end of his second term i think which is in particular interesting because this was relatively insignificant that would have effectively uh stopped like 25 percent of the additional debt crisis which wasn't major so like i said moderate changes to everything now, what salvaged his career was that he uh, a, a strong wind propelled him to have 4% growth. Now, let's go into his congressional activities. He was implementing a protocol to the Department of Defense, which was supposed to let openly gay people serve in the military in a time when most people were against that. And even some people uh, were willing to compromise. Republicans didn't want, didn't want gays in the military, period. Clinton wanted open grays, so he compromised and said, don't ask, don't tell, right? So, and so closeted homosexuals in the military. Yet again, he moved the needle, not all the way that he wanted, not all the way that some gays wanted, but he did give them more rights, ultimately. This is seen that even in the biographies of certain Secret Service agents that uh, Bill was able to to appease some, but still the fringes of the Democratic Party came and protested at the White House. They still tried to, you know, tear up the walls of the White House. He, the gay activists were crazy at this point. And Bill, in 1994, was able to sign as the first important thing that he did that year was the NAFTA agreement into law. Now, he was against, this was against mostly anti-trade Republicans like Pat Buchanan, protectionist Democrats in like the Ross Perot types and the bill passed the house with 234 votes with 200 opposed and most of these voters were in favor of this bill which were Democrats so Democrats Democrats were not for this bill in total so basically bill used a coalition like he has done before triangulating basically to be getting the center left and the center right together as 60% of the population basically and help them out 1994 as well Clinton launched the whitehouse.gov website he was the first president to implement the internet into his administration I believe and after two years of his control of both congresses I believe that uh, the Republicans in the Gingrich Revolution in 1994 were able to um, hurt the prospects in the Senate for the Democrats and also flip the House majorly by several dozen po uh, seats. In 1996, well, 1995, Newt Gingrich was able to summon up power to become the majority uh, leader as well as uh, he used to be minority whip, but he went up all the way to Speaker of the House. He was the main guy opposed to the Clinton administration, and he was the main guy who was theoretically against most things that he did after that point now up to this point in the video bill clinton has done a myriad of little things that have added up to a different country a more liberal society but after 1995 it seems that he starts going more right wing substantially until even nowadays he looks like a moderate republican now in september 21st to 29th of 1996 he signs into law the defense of marriage act which defines the federal purpose of marriage as a legal union between one man and one woman. So, of course, anti-polygamy. Polygamy. He, he also let states recognize gay marriages as an old and not servicing. 
and he purposely uh, compromised, and he sort of like he sort of violated the trust that he had of the Stonewall Democrats and the gay people and the liberal apparatus, and he betrayed them, and he did this to get more brownie points with conservatives, right? And this was to drive a wedge issue. Most Republicans and a lot of Democrats voted for the Defense of Marriage Act, including Joe Biden. And Bernie Sanders did not vote for that. But this is supposed to be a sort of um, concession to the to the Republicans. And the Republicans that still wanted more anti-gay legislation were seen as radical, whereas Bill Clinton was the reasonable one, even to the liberals and some of the Republicans. This is just part of the triangulation which was emphasized by uh, Christopher Hitchens, the guy who's a socialist, but clearly uh, sees the hypocrisies of Bill Clinton in terms of the uh, leftist view. So he, But even despite of the DOMA Act, he was the first president to select openly homosexual people into the cabinet or the administrative positions he could have uh, gotten. And he's the first president to publicly champion gay rights more so than Jimmy Carter before him. And he wanted to protect uh, the gay federal employees as well. So he was he was honored by GLAD and other associations that um, that even though got screwed over by him were ultimately pushed you know pushed the needle leftward. Now the nineteen ninety six presidential election is pretty important as he is becoming more right wing and the Republicans are seeing that the economy is not bad at all. So the incumbent presidency of Bill Clinton was insurmountable to some extent. So Bill was able to win this big league, and that's even with Ross Perot running again, which was a more of a partisan split, of course, in a lot of the Ross Perot uh, vengeance was because of NAFTA and because of the lack of deficit reduction. So like I said, um, the... He was able to piss off the the left and the uh, fiscal conservatives enough to warrant a significant challenge uh, in the ways of Ross Perot. But clearly, a lot of that old flame died out because Ross Perot ended up getting less than 10% of the vote. And Bill Clinton was able to get closer to the um, majority, 49.2% of the vote. Uh, Bob Dole, 407 Okay, so... We get into this election, and you see that uh, Bob Dole was Senate Majority Leader when he could, and he was a Senate Minority Leader to some extent. Uh, in the beginning of the Clinton presidency, he was about 70-ish years old at the time, which in particular was bad because you're running against a guy who, even in the second term, supposedly, would have been the third youngest president, and he would have been about uh, in his early 50s at this point. So he was young. Uh, for our president, and he was, at the time, not necessarily the right guy to run against Bill. He was 73 years old, so he was the, he was going to be the oldest president, uh, older than Trump is now, even somewhat. So, or about the same age, and he was running for the first time. So this guy was not ready, and Bill Clinton was able to emphasize, or not even that, but he was letting Bob Dole play himself. Bob Dole had accidents, he had to be hospitalized, he had to do all these things that were just showing that he was not adept. He was like Joe Biden in his time. So Bill Clinton was able to win easily. And in the second term, in the second in the State of the Union for the first time in that second term, he was able to provide a new initiative to cover five million children. And this was what uh CHIP is, right? Children's Health Insurance Program. And this was with the sponsorship of Ted Kennedy and even Orrin Hatch, a Republican who's who's uh, part of the old guard of either party. And these people, and this was a, a token throwaway to the liberals, and I think Clinton also was able to get bona fides with the people that were disappointed with the 1996 campaign. And Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton negotiated the passage of the balanced Budget Act of 1997, which was by that Republican Newt Gingrich Congress, he announced that he was getting um, rid of the Glass-Steagall Act, and he was basically still in that vein of the neoliberal that was banning certain regulations that were populistic. Now, in contrast to what people say about him, 
Bill was, in effect, less populistic than what he had envisioned, you know. Bill Clinton ideally would have covered everybody, but no, he just wanted to cover children because he knew he could get that done. Or, ideally, he wanted gay rights, but he clearly wasn't even close to getting that. So, he was a compromising figure, and he would do what he needed to do to stay in power and slowly move that needle. So, he was impeached. Now, this was because of his own personal faults in that 92 campaign. He was accused of, of having affairs, which were true. Then there was all these uh, conspiracy theories that he had raped people and that he had, uh, you know, uh, done bad things ostensibly. And he had uh, violated women and all these things, which, you know, after you get enough accusations, you would think some of them are true. But anyway, this was not the problem necessarily. This is more later. But in this case, he had had an intern that was 30 years younger than him, that was 21 at the time, paid by federal payroll. Um, and they had an affair, right? And uh, this was all recorded, and it was all true. And, you know, this alienated, obviously, conservatives that were thinking that, you know, him doing this was wrong, but most moderate people said, well, who cares? He is a, um, he's a president. It, this doesn't affect anything. So he shouldn't be impeached, but he was. And the House voted 228 and to 206 to impeach him for the perjury that he did and to a grand jury. He was voted on the charge of perjury, right, and obstruction of justice. He lied about not having an affair, but then he admitted to having it. So that was a political loss for him. But when you looked at the Senate, the Senate voted 55 not guilty, 45 guilty. So you need a 66 vote, I think, or something like that, to, you know, a very strong supermajority to impeach and remove a president. But he was only impeached, similar to Donald Trump. Uh, he pardoned f uh, 141 people and got 36 commissions on his last day in office. He wanted to pardon everybody he could last minute, so this goes to his corruption, okay? Now, he was also uh, bewildered because on the domestic sector, yes, he was able to balance the budget, and he was able to get credit for it, even though he was able to cut the capital gains tax, which incentivized stock market growth. He was not responsible necessarily for the growth of Microsoft and other companies that let him grow the the economy to 4% or 5% in the second term of his presidency, which allowed him to balance the budget. Now, if we go into the military affairs of Bill Clinton, he was presiding over the Battle of Mogadishu in 1993, Two Black Hawk helicopters were shot down by RPGs um, to the tail mortars of the tail rotors of their of their given you know battleships. This was an urban battle that killed 18 soldiers and wounded 73 others. Another was taken the prince uh, prisoner, and it was expected that about a thousand Somalis were killed in this. And this was a spectacular uh, spectacular type of showing by the U.S. military, but it also shows that Bill Clinton, yet again, cannot be a commander-in-chief to a lot of criticizers, you know, a lot of haters would say that he could have mobilized uh, armored troops to defend these people and to bail them out, but he did, not, he did not want to get his hand involved in that Somalian Civil War type war-torn area anymore, so he kind of let them die there, you know, and saved them last minute. Now, in April of 1994, genocide broke out in Rwanda. And it was shown that Clinton was able to eliminate to Bill Clinton knew of this and he knew that there was a supposed final solution to eliminate all these other uh, Negroes involved. You know, Rwanda has two main demographics, including the Tutsis and the other blacks who wanted to kill these uh, Tutsis and they were able to by machete and not so much through the even the German way of genocide. Uh, so. Clinton wanted not to intervene this time because he felt that if he got one foot in, one foot out like he did in Somalia, it would blow up in his face like Somalia did. Now, his approval rating tanked, and also he was looked down upon because, like I said, this gave ammunition on Republicans in 1994 because he clearly did not stop a genocide when he could have. It would have been very easy, but Bill Clinton, in his ignorance and his cowardness, said that he that w how would there be a genocide with just machetes? How would the Africans be 
you know, able to logistically do it, and he underestimated those uh, Rwandans. So he, that was a that was a mistake. Bosnia and Herzegovina in southern Europe in the Balkans. In 1995, he with NATO bombed the Bosnian Serb targets that um, that had been uh, trying to commit genocide upon, among each other. Basically, the, the we're talking about the dissolution of Yugoslavia in the 90s. But Clinton deployed peacekeepers into Bosnia in the 90s, and he was a neoconservative in this aspect that he was very involved. This ingratiated him with everybody but the fringes of the right wing and the left wing, of course. He was able to sign a peace treaty, basically, to nor to Northern Ireland, and he was able to uh, try to, to endear himself with the British by trying to stop terrorism there. So that was a win. Then in Iran, he was able to pay $131 million, or about $200 million in today's money, to discontinue a case brought by Iran against the U.S. and in the International Court of Justice. So he was able to fix that issue, which is good. Osama bin Laden was an objective for the U.S. government during Bill Clinton's presidency. And despite that, he was not able to do it because... He built, like I said, one foot in, one foot out. He did not focus on getting it done. In response to a warning by the State Departing, warning about Bill Bin Laden, uh, Bill Clinton did not stop the 1998 bombings of U.S. embassies in the East Africa uh, area. So that killed 224 people, you know, civilians, and most especially killed a dozen Americans. And Clinton ordered several military missions to capture and kill bin Laden, and all of them did not work. In 1998, Clinton ordered cruise missile strikes on terrorist targets in Afghanistan and Sudan, which was to create a distraction. Okay, Bill Clinton was, in, was proposing bombing a pharmaceutical factory in Sudan, which was vaguely suspected of killing of helping bin Laden in order to distract from that 90, 1998 impeachment saga with Monica Lewinsky. So that was opportunistic, of course, killing a lot of innocent people. In Kosovo, he was in the midst of a brutal crackdown of ethnic Albanian separatists in Yugoslavia, and he was also able to intervene there. And he was also antagonizing Slobodan Milosevic, and he brought him under trial in uh, in Hague against crimes with you know crimes against humanity was the charge, and he was able to get him dead basically. So that was a success. In 1998's uh, State of the Union address, he warned that to Congress that that Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons of mass destruction. This set the president for Bill uh, for Bush's basically, but unlike Bush, who wanted a total invasion of Iraq. He just wanted to weaken Hassan Hussein's grip on the power of Iraq, so he oper he sent Operation Desert Fox, which was only a three-day campaign that was just to hurt the logistics of Iraq and bomb the hell out of them. And he made a no-fly zone as well, so he did what Hillary Clinton wanted to do in Syria. Now, with foreign diplomacy in Vietnam, he was the first guy to end the Vietnam War very officially or to, you know, visit it, basically, like Trump did to North Korea. So in 2000, he was able to do this, and he signed a sort of normalization of trade relations, which opened up uh, Vietnam. This led to the explosion of their economy, In it was mainly through cheap uh, manual labor exploitation. And this was also a good time because with these uh, trade deals, he was able to back them up by saying that with these it helped them balance the budget. He also wanted to let China into the World Trade Organization, which is one of the biggest or, you know, the populist call, one of the biggest mistakes of all time, you know. He let the Chinese and expand their markets into our countries and were able to export all these US manufacturing jobs, five million of them, to China, which killed the states of Michigan, Ohio, etc., Indiana. So this hurt Democrats later on. In 2016, for example, had he not done that, then Hillary Clinton would have won those states because they wouldn't have been complaining that Clinton 
moved so many millions of jobs to other countries. He also tried to do the Oslo Accord, which was in the early 90s, and he tried to make a two-state solution, and it obviously didn't work because of Yasser Arafat. Uh, um, he broke the peace deal, basically, and he was a liar. So Bill Clinton failed in solving the Israel question. In terms of judicial appointments, of course, Bill Clinton appointed Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a person who is instrumental in allowing abortions insofar as she's the only person stopping the conservative court from over, overall just killing Roe v. Wade and overturning it. And he also appointed Stephen Breyer, who, although is also in that 5-4 uh, Democrat minority in the Supreme Court, he has been less important as he has not held up to the prestige of that Jewish woman uh, Ginsburg was. So, overall, two Supreme Court appointments is pretty typical for a two-term president and pretty instrumental in keeping abortion rights overall. And, you know, uh, he was also able to appoint a lot of token minorities into judicial courts. He wanted to support women, and he purposely sought out campaign uh, programmers and uh, staffers that that were minorities, so he pulled across there, and this was all able to make him pretty popular as a president. Insofar that his popularity, given downward spikes being above fifty five percent in the majority of the time, and he left the presidency at about a sixty percent approval rating. Now, Bill Clinton as a man was pretty well regarded. You know, you take away. A couple of big mistakes, and you take away the 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 him being a pervert, and he would be a great guy, you know, a great uh, public figure, and he still is, but you know, not as much now. Bill Clinton is also a guy who was well regarded, particularly with black people, and he was able to ingratiate himself with Republicans that acknowledge his physical conservatism, relatively speaking. And he also was able to campaign onwards to be a guy who was a, a philanthropist with other people's money. He was able to give a ton of money to Haiti that has not recovered since their, um, their uh, what was it, earthquake. So, And then he was able to start up that Clinton Foundation, like I said, a philanthropist. He fought for climate change, uh, fighting, so whatever, and then... He, he made a ton of recreational parks named after him, of course, and he did he mostly uses his his publicity or his his stature in the Democratic Party, which he is still famous in, like Obama, to help people like Obama. And he he was able to help Hillary Clinton lose to Obama in 2008. That is to say that he has clout in the Democratic Party and as a person, and he uses that to get money from people and to help other people when my hearts and minds so he was instrumental in helping obama beat mitt romney and uh solidifying that centrist coalition to help obama and he also campaigned for hillary now for hillary he campaigned and it didn't work uh clearly his is free trade bit him in the ass but but he is still remembered as a hero in places like Kosovo and Yugoslavia where he intervened. So overall, a pretty good record as a president. I would rate him as a president um, 7 out of 10. I think he did well in economics. Uh, in terms of civil rights, I think he was a moderate. I think he towed the line pretty well. Um, you know, allowing for a civil rights that was not necessarily in your face, but, you know, Low key, I can respect that. You know, even a Trump supporter can uh, respect that. Now, in terms of trade, he was awful. He perpetuated the immigration issues and he paid moderate lip service, in fact, to a lot of Republican issues like the crime bill of 1994. And I think that he screwed his own wife over in 2008 and 2016. So with his own actions as president as being free trade and, you know, a sellout to corporations in a large way. And I think that a lot of that economic success, like I said, wasn't even his doing. And it was just uh, by chance that he got lucky. I think that that otherwise he's pretty good. So I think a 7 out of 10 is warranted.
and I thank you guys for watching this very long video, but I've re really been studying this topic. So, like I said, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. Comment down below if you liked it. Goodbye.